my talk is titled Dementia, Inspiring Hope, Retaining Realism. And you can see here that I actually work at the University of New South Wales in two centres. The one on the left is the Dementia Collaborative Research Centre, which is funded by the Commonwealth Department of Health through NHMRC and the Centre for Healthy Brain Aging, or CHIBA, at UNSW, and we fund that ourselves by raising money um, through philanthropy. So the morning has been put on by Alzheimer's Australia uh, with the NHMRC, and uh, you'll see their logos represented here. And what I'll talk about is the cause of Alzheimer's disease, why it's important, diagnosis, what we can all do to prevent Alzheimer's and other dementias. Well, what I'm saying is, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I'll talk about the silver bullet, uh, if there is one or not, and finish up by quality of life and some conclusions. So let me just get some terms straight, because the commonest question all of us working in this field get is, what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? So dementia is the umbrella term. It means loss of memory and other thinking or cognitive functions which interfere with day-to-day -day life. There are over 100 causes for dementia. Alzheimer's accounts for at least 50% of those causes and is by far and away the most common. Second comes vascular dementia, which is problems with circulation in the brain or multiple small strokes or bigger strokes. Then a disease called Lewy body dementia and frontotemporal dementia and many, many others. The other concept I just want to clarify is something called mild cognitive impairment. So people who complain about memory problems and on testing have some weaknesses in their memory or other cognitive abilities, but are functioning normally, do not meet criteria for dementia. They're labelled as having mild cognitive impairment. Some of them will go on to develop dementia, some will say stable, and some will improve. Now, what happens in the brain of someone with Alzheimer's disease? If you look at the brain, take it out of the skull at post-mortem, we'll see it's very shrunken, and examining under a microscope, we see most of the nerve cells are withered away. They're atrophied, and their branches or synapses, the junctions with other nerve cells, have also been affected. And what happens in the brain is we all have this protein in our brain on the cells called the amyloid precursor protein, or, or APP. And all mammals have it. It's a very highly conserved molecule in nature. It must be doing something important. But, and we constantly make and break chemicals in our body. We have little recycling cells. All our cells are recycling. And when this APP is broken down, the two parts of it can usually be recycled. But sometimes there's other enzymes, well, let's call them the bad enzymes, although they have good functions, uh, which can break down this protein, releasing a fragment called the A-beta protein. It's a very small fragment, only 42 amino acids or thereabouts. And this A-beta fragment clumps together. And these clumps are thought to be what's toxic and cause damage to nerve cells, and then it continues as a process. It becomes a positive feedback loop. The body reacts to this, this clump, these clumps or these oligomers of the A-beta protein and forms plaques as a, perhaps a way to protect the brain from them. As well as the A-beta or the amyloid pathway, there's also another protein which goes awry and it's a tau protein which gets a phosphorus stuck on it and it becomes toxic and the nerve cells become all twisted inside and they die. We don't know which comes first. Most of the emphasis has been on the amyloid pathway, and when I come to talk about treatment, that's important. If you look at the chemicals in the brain, most of them are deficient in people with Alzheimer's. There's a gradual decline in them, particularly one called acetylcholine, which is the major chemical for nerve cells involved in memory to talk to each other. So these are neurotransmitters, or chemicals that nerve cells release to talk to each other. So boosting that acetylcholine may benefit memory or other cognitive functions. So that's what's happening in the brain, but why is it happening? What's the cause? There are two major theories.
So one is that we make too much of this A-beta protein. So we cut up the big protein, the APP, the amyloid precursor protein, which we all have, and release too much of the A-beta protein, which the body can't handle. It can't be recycled. And it clumps together and is toxic. And this is particularly the case in people with younger onset dementia who have a strong family history. And I mean really strong, every second member of each generation. And these people, about 1% of all Alzheimer's they represent, um, generally present to clinicians in their 40s or 50s. So it's very sad. Any Alzheimer's is sad, but this is particularly sad. Most Alzheimer's comes on later in life. The modal age is around about early 80s. And that's probably because there's decreased clearance. So we build up this abnormal fragment, the A-beta protein, and we probably all make some of this stuff, and we can get rid of it from the, from the brain. But if we're not very efficient at getting rid of it, it accumulates and becomes toxic. And that's what most Alzheimer's is thought to be caused by, or at least part of the cause of it. There are many other aspects to the cause of Alzheimer's. There's that tau protein, which I mentioned gets the phosphorus stuck on it. That has a pretty critical role. And there are many, many other pathways. There's theories about the support cells in the brain, the astrocytes and the microglia. So our brain is full of nerve cells, but there are other cells which, which protect them and nurture them. There's more inflammation in the brain in people with Alzheimer's. There's increased insulin resistance, which may be linked to the high rate of dementia, Alzheimer's in people with type 2 diabetes. And there are other, many other proteins which go awry, which may be involved in the cause of Alzheimer's disease. So the hope is that we can find the exact cause. The realism is we know that for young onset autosomal dominant, that 1% of all Alzheimer's, it's familial. It runs in families very strongly and comes on in the 40s and 50s, and that's overproduction. That seems pretty clear. Or faults with the enzymes that, that snip and release this abnormal um, A-beta fragment. But in late onset, we know risk factors, we know what's happening in the brain, but we don't really know what causes it, why some people get it and some don't. We're doing a study of twins, identical and non-identical twins. We have a number of twins, identical twins, one has Alzheimer's and the other doesn't. Now, Harry Johns will talk to us about the global scene and the US scene with dementia, but just in a nutshell, there are thought to be 47 million people in the world with dementia, rising to 130 million by 2050, and about two-thirds living in the developing world. China and India alone will account for half the world's population with dementia within a generation. That's 10 million new cases a year, or one every three seconds. And the cost is, is huge, and we'll hear more about that shortly. But 1% of the global gross domestic product. In Australia, as Janice has mentioned, 413,000 people with dementia in the estimates that came out last month, predicted to rise to 1.1 million by 2056, so in 50 years, um, almost a tripling. And that's 244 new cases a day, which means 10 cases an hour or one case every six minutes. The cost to the community, $14 billion. And just under two thirds of that is direct cost. Cost of doctors, medications, nursing home, community care. And about one third is indirect cost. People having to give up work because they've got the disease or because they're caring. And we see this rising high, um, rising to a height of 28 billion in 50 years. Now, we're very keen on prevention, we all are. And if there were 5% fewer people aged over 65 who were prevented from developing Alzheimer's, and that's a realistic uh, possibility, the savings you can see listed there would be massive. And the cumulative savings would be $120 billion by 2056. And as we heard, there are quite, a, we think of dementia as an old person's disease. 
but there are either 25, 26 or 28,000, there are different estimates, of people who develop dementia before the age of 65. The youngest patient I've seen is 42. Uh, personally, I've seen patients who are 35 who've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease too. It's very rare. So why is dementia important? <laughs> and because we're all afraid of it. If we do surveys of people and ask them, what do you worry about most? It used to be cancer. Now it's dementia, Alzheimer's in particular. And when we're scared of something, we make jokes about it. We try and diffuse our anxiety with humor. Well, that's not that funny, I guess. OK. <laughs> so dementia is important because we're afraid of it. We're getting older as a population. We're living longer. From 1900 to 2000, we gained 25 years in life expectancy. That's a quarter of a year a year for 100 years. And we're still gaining life expectancy. A girl born today has about a 40% chance of reaching, reaching 100. Age is the major risk factor for dementia. So if we're living longer, we're more at risk. And it's important because I think everyone here knows somebody with dementia or has it themselves. We're all being touched by it in some way. And we see what dementia does. And that's why it's important. Not just the numbers, not just the economy, the personal cost. So what's the hope? Can we cure it? Can we prevent it? Well, here's the hope. It seems to be that numbers are decreasing. The numbers of new cases in studies from Sweden, Denmark, United Kingdom, um, United States, uh, Spain, have all shown a decrease in the number of new cases in the last 20 years. And the thinking is that this is caused by better education, better health care, better eating, better lifestyle. We can't prove it, but that's the theory. But let's be realistic. While the number of new cases might be decreasing, and there's a study that just came out this last month from Holland saying they didn't find that in Holland in a, in a GP uh, study, the actual total number of cases is increasing. How can that be? Well, because the ageing of the population is even a greater effect than the decrease in the number of new cases. And people with dementia are living longer. So if you have the same number of people living twice as long, the number of cases or the prevalence will be double. The other things are we're having epidemics of obesity and diabetes. That's in all developed countries. And these are both risk factors for Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. In developing countries, what we've achieved in 100 years with our ageing of society is going to happen in a generation. So we're now at 14% over 65. We'll be 25% by 2050. Countries like China, they've seen the problems with the one-child policy. And we're just hearing now about They've relaxed it to a two-child policy because they realise the problems they're going to have with one child, two parents and four grandparents. How are they going to manage that with a country of 1.6 billion? Let me turn now to diagnosis. Studies indicate that there's a gap between the onset of symptoms and the first diagnosis of about two, three years. And many of us are working to shrink the gap. Timely diagnosis. In fact, we're involved in a study with Alzheimer's Australia, Dementia Training Australia, and La Trobe University, and the Dementia Collaborative Research Centre, to try and reach one in five Australian GPs, either face-to-face -face teaching or online with learning modules. Because 50% of mild dementia is undiagnosed in general practice big number. So traditionally, diagnosis is made by, I take a history, and I, I do this each week, we take a history from the person, from their family member, do an examination, do various tests, and come up with a diagnosis. There's a revolution happening in diagnosis. And the revolution is mainly in neuroimaging. 
So MRI, MRI scans have been with us for some time. And PET imaging has too, but only in more recent years are we able to actually image these abnormal proteins accumulating in the brain in people with Alzheimer's. So we can see the plaques, and we're now able to look at the tau protein as well in the brain. And this has meant what we could only see at post-mortem, we can now see in life. And this has led to a revolution. These are not on Medicare items, these are not on routine tests. They are available uh, at cost. The other investigation is cerebrospinal fluid. So this is the fluid that bathes the brain. It's inside the brain in the ventricles and around the surface, and it circulates around the brain and up and down our spinal cord. And so we can access that fluid by putting a needle into the base of the spine, a lumbar puncture or spinal tap. And that spinal fluid can be analysed, and I'll come to that. There's been a lot of work on, genetis, on genetics and trying to find a blood test. And there are some genes that have been identified as risk factors, but apart from that 1% of familial Alzheimer's where the genes have been definitely identified, we can only say other genes are risk factors. So this is a PET scan. And where's the... And what I want to draw your attention to is the hotter the colour, the more amyloid, the more of this abnormal um, toxic protein building up in the brain. This is a person with Alzheimer's disease, so you can see lots of red. If we move over here to a person who doesn't have Alzheimer's, no red, no amyloid in the brain. But what's surprising is this person in the middle, who's normal cognitively, but has quite a lot of amyloid. And so recent studies have been looking at normal people, people without cognitive impairment, finding that people over 65, about a third of them, have amyloid in their brain, in varying degrees. And having amyloid in the brain increases the risk of clinical progression. What we don't know is whether all people with amyloid in the brain will develop Alzheimer's. And we don't know when. We don't know when. And I'm going to ask you a question in a minute, so I hope you're paying attention. With the spinal tap, we can see a decrease in the A-beta protein in the spinal fluid because it's all getting shoved into these plaques and it increased in the tau and the phosphorylated tau, the tau with the phosphate stuck on it, uh, in the CSF. And if measurements of the CSF, the spinal fluid, are normal, it's very unlikely a person has Alzheimer's. In many countries, Examined lumbar punctures are routine tests. In Australia, people are not very keen on having a needle stuck in their spine. Understandably, okay. The diagnosis of Alzheimer's. So the realism, the biggest challenge, is in fact not with these high-tech diagnostic investigations. It's in primary care. We don't yet have a test that's 100% accurate. There's no blood test sufficiently accurate to use a standard practice. The other issue is the older the person, the less likely they have, they are likely to have one pathology, like pure Alzheimer's or pure vascular. So when the brains are looked at in people over 90 or 85, 90 or whatever, they usually have multiple pathology. And they may have something called sclerosis of the hippocampus, which is like a, a scarring, if you like, of the hippocampus as well. So it's unlikely to be just one thing. Currently, predictive testing is not accurate enough and not recommended. But here's the question to you. I'm going to ask you to put up your hand. If there were a test that could predict you are going to get Alzheimer's disease, would you have the test? Who would have the test? OK. Um, what if it wouldn't tell you when? So it could be in two years, but it could be in 25 years. You don't know when you're going to get it. Who would have the test? Still quite a lot of people. Okay, who wouldn't have the test? <laughs> okay. Well, we, I mean, the point of having a test is what you can do about it. Okay. And that's what I'm going to come to. So we can do all these things for prevention now without having a test. We can't eliminate the disease like we have smallpox. Although there's a lot of work in trying to derive vaccines. Vaccines that would target the 
the toxic protein, uh, the uh, amyloid beta protein, or perhaps the tau protein or some combination. Um, and that would be given to people at risk. So there's a lot of research in that area. But what's more probable is delaying the onset. And just delaying it by two years, you can see the numbers of people affected in the world will be 20% fewer, and five years, half. Why? Because Alzheimer's disease is a disease of late life, largely. And if we could delay it just a few years, ideally till after we died, <laughs> then, of course, there would be no Alzheimer's disease. So what's the best target? It may be that early life is the best target. Uh, research grants usually only last three or five years. And so doing a study of people throughout life is longer than the researcher's lifespan or the funding lifespan by far. But looking at observational studies in countries where there's low education, low fetal birth weight for gestational age, and poor socioeconomic environment, these may be important risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, not only in those developing countries, but in our own Aboriginal population. Studies of Aboriginals in Australia have shown a higher rate than in non-Indigenous population. A small study from the Kimberley region in Western Australia found rates five times higher than the non-Indigenous population and coming on at an earlier age and mainly Alzheimer's in, in cause. So what you can do to prevent, Alzheimer's Australia has had this website for some years, yourbrainmatters.org.au. And just five things, and this is a take home message you could all do. Look after your heart, keep physically active, keep mentally active, keep socially active, and eat well. So, and I'll go through these in a bit more detail. So the more vascular risk factors you have, the higher your rate of Alzheimer's disease and of heart, of stroke, of vascular disease, sorry. Uh, things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, obesity, type 2 diabetes, physical inactivity. So your, your risks just go up the more risk factors you have. Now, I'd like to express my thanks to the Daily Express and the other tabloid press in the United Kingdom. Uh, I like to illustrate my talks with lurid headlines, and they have lots of them, as you'll see. Okay. So here's one from 2012, Statins Halt Alzheimer's Disease. Well, probably not. Um, so there's a Cochrane review which came out last year, which said there's good evidence that statins neither prevent nor increase the risk of cognitive impairment or dementia. There was another review that came out in a very prestigious journal, which found that there was a link to reducing the risk when they analysed it by looking at different sexes, different races and different statins. So there may be some protective effect, but by and large, the general view is statins are not protective, nor are they a risk factor, as some once claimed. Physical activity. Who exercises regularly? What a great audience. OK, all right, OK. Well, um, congratulations. Um, exercise protects against dementia, preserves cognition, slows cognitive decline, decreases the number of new cases, and in a review of 11 randomised controlled trials in healthy older people, cognition and fitness improved. Another study where they took people aged over 70 who were worried about their memory, half when exercise, half no exercise, and they measured their size of the hippocampus, this area in our temporal lobes, which is our short-term memory centre. And they measured it using MRI scans before and a year later. And the people who exercised, the hippocampus got bigger. The people who didn't exercise, the hippocampus shrunk about 0.7%, which is what we all have per year with our brains. So exercise actually can increase your brain volume. Um, in animal studies, where they can actually examine the brains and look at the chemicals, there's more growth factors in the brain, more brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is a, a, a nurturing um, chemical for the brain, more new nerve cells formed, less inflammation. And in mice genetically engineered to make Alzheimer's disease, mice in a cage where they could run around, exercise, uh, spinning wheels and things, versus sedentary mice unable to do any exercise, 
the mice who were exercising had less Alzheimer pathology. So they were genetically engineered to make Alzheimer's disease, but the exercise did give them some protection. So the message is, it's never too late to start. Recommended at least half an hour a day, five days a week. More is better, getting puffed and sweaty. If you can talk comfortably, walking with your friends, you're not walking fast enough. <laughs> There's no evidence for specific exercise, but there is emerging data to say that resistance training may have some specific benefits. So that's pulling pulleys or pushing weights, and probably a mixture of exercises, some aerobic and anaerobic is good. In a study we did called the SMART trial led by Maria Fiadaroni Singh, the resistance training had the best benefit on cognition. So the hope, physical activity, it improves fitness, decreases heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, some types of cancer, thinning of our bones and loss of muscle mass, which in old age is a major risk factor for falls. It reduces morbidity, mortality, improves mental health, improves confidence, improves quality of life, and I wish I could put it in a pill, but it's fantastic, <laughs> and we should all be doing more. Now, that's the physical exercise. What about the mental activity? My colleagues at Chiba, 10 years ago, did a meta-analysis of 22 studies, almost 30,000 individuals, and they found that people in late life who involved in more complex mental activity had half the rate of dementia at follow-up. Half. And they controlled for various other um, confounders in that study. Now, in the last 10 years, there's been a phenomenal growth in computer cognitive training. Lumosity, for example. Uh, Happy Neuron, Posit Science. There are lots of programs out there you can sign up for and pay for. And there is accumulating evidence that they're beneficial. They're beneficial for healthy older people, and they're beneficial for people with this mild cognitive impairment I mentioned earlier. Um, but for people with dementia, it may not be beneficial. It may be too late. So the studies on people with dementia, established dementia, have not been positive. Now, there are some realism points to make here. It may be that people who are developing Alzheimer's disease, and I should tell you, this develops in the brain over 20 or 30 years before the diagnosis is made. So those of us here in the audience who are destined to get Alzheimer's are probably already accumulating this pathology. And if we do a 10-year follow-up to prove something is protective, it may be the people who already have the pathology in their brain have already stopped doing some of these cognitive exercises or being as active. Which activity? I'd like to think it's crosswords, because I, I love doing the crosswords, but I don't know if it's enough, or Sudoku. But stretching your brain appears better, you know, learning a new musical instrument, a new language. There were doubts about the computer cognitive training being um, sustained benefits, but recent studies have suggested they are, and that they generalise beyond the computer into everyday life. A study presented at the Alzheimer's International Conference last July was a 10-year follow-up of the ACTIVE study, which was a computer cognitive training program. And they found 10 years later that people who were doing the uh, speed of information processing training and reasoning training had better cognition, had less dementia, and were more driving still 10 years later. OK, this is, uh, I think, 2016. They, they actually, the Daily Express got this right. Med feed good for the brain. That's the Mediterranean diet. And that's where the most evidence is from the Mediterranean diet. This is a lots of grains as our base. And as we go up the pyramid, we eat less and less of these things. So lots of vegetables, beans, legumes, nuts, fruits. Olive oil, in one study, one litre of extra virgin olive oil per week. Wow. <laughs> I, I, yeah, OK. But that was in Spain, that study. OK. Uh, cheese, yoghurt. And then fish, also some epidemiological work, and then lesser amounts of poultry, eggs, sweets, and red meat, e even less. That's the Mediterranean diet pyramid. Less than a third of your intake should be fats, less than 8% saturated fats. Fish, yes, there is evidence. Not, a, not randomized control, but epidemiological evidence. Um, for omega-3, 
less evidence, folic acid and B vitamins, some evidence from the Oxford group, but the, some reviews, the Cochrane Review, for example, didn't find benefit for it. Vitamin D, people who are low in vitamin D have worse cognition, but it's never been proven that vitamin D taking it actually improves cognition. There's some studies suggesting caffeine's beneficial, which is good news. Um, yeah, thank you, okay. Uh, vitamin E, I think the jury's out, and vitamin C, no evidence. As a general rule, getting this stuff from your food is better than taking, buying supplements. It's pretty clear evidence that smoking is bad for you, for your heart, for your lungs, etc., for other cancers. Also bad for Alzheimer's. But it's current smoking, so those who are still smoking, uh, reducing your sm or cutting your smoking will, great, will quickly reduce or get rid of that risk. Alcohol. The good news is that moderate alcohol may be good for our brains. The evidence is very soft and it's controversial. <laughs> and what is moderate? Uh, the professor from France who said half a litre a day was moderate doesn't fit with the NHMRC guidelines of two standard drinks a day. Um, so what we know is heavy alcohol is a risk factor and people who, who are teetotal may have a slightly higher risk but it may be some of those that can, are people who've given up alcohol because of their health. So it's not so clear cut. I'm not suggesting anyone take up alcohol if you don't drink but if you do drink and it may be that wine is, is better uh, because it has more antioxidants and polyphenols. There are lots of natural therapies that people make claims for, and there is no evidence that any of them does make any difference. The only ones that have been subjected to a good clinical trial is uh, ginkgo biloba, two large trials, one in France, one in the US, both showed no benefit. Um, so, but they're very popular. Now, they may work, they just haven't been shown to work. And there are many, many unproven claims. So don't believe them. So the realism, the best evidence is the Mediterranean diet. But the Mediterranean diet is linked to exercise, vascular health, diabetes, obesity. So you're really catching many risk factors all at once. Obesity in midlife is a risk factor, but not in late life. Most of these claims are in observational studies. I cannot do an, a randomised control trial and say I want this half of the room for the next 20 years to eat a certain diet and that half not to. You can't do those sort of. You have to just see what people are doing and then try it and work it out. There are many other environmental factors. Hormone replacement therapy, um, close to the menopause, is probably neither harmful nor beneficial. Hearing loss has been associated with increased risk. People who socialise less has been associated with increased risk. And some recent studies on air pollution, but that is very, I think, uh, very soft evidence. Putting it together, 30% of the population of attributable risk of Alzheimer's could be put down to seven environmental factors. Things like obesity and high blood pressure and low education um, and physical inactivity. In developed countries like the United States, Australia, Europe, it's obesity and low physical inactivity, which are the strongest environmental factors that we can do something about. Everyone of us here can do something about that. In the developing countries, it's low education. There are clinical trials to prevent Alzheimer's disease, and the most successful one has been one from Finland. And they combine diet, cognitive training, exercise, resistance and aerobic, managing met metabolic, like diabetes, and vascular, like hypertension risk factors, and social activities. Two years out, the group in the active intervention had uh, a better profile neuropsychologically, better executive function, better process processing speed, not better memory. The trial continues, and when the five-year results come out, we hope we'll see even more dramatic advances. I think that the next stage is internet-based interventions. And there's one that's, being, uh, that's happening now in the Netherlands, um, and one that we're starting here in Australia, Maintain Your Brain. And we are going to be recruiting 18,000 people through the 45 and up study. 
So people can't volunteer for this. These are people who are already in a New South Wales funded study, age 55 to 75, and they will get one of, they'll get up to four modules on diet, exercise, cognitive training, and treatment of depression or stress management. And we'll do a module every three months, and after 12 months, they'll get boosters, and we'll follow them up over four years. And what we hope to show is less cognitive decline and fewer people developing dementia. Uh, that's a really exciting trial. And you can read about some of this research on our Chiba website shown below. What about drugs to prevent Alzheimer's disease? Don't look at the women, look at the headline, Alzheimer's revolution, <laughs> okay. So there are some really exciting studies happening, pretty well all in the US, some internationally. So the A4 study, these are people who have amyloid in their brain but are cognitively normal, putting them on a drug or on placebo to see what happens. People, Diane's study is dominantly inherited Alzheimer's network. People who have the gene and know with 100% certainty they will get Alzheimer's disease, generally in their 40s or 50s. Or this big group from Colombia, huge family, which also has a gene that's been identified. And all these studies, pretty well all of them, are looking at antibody studies against the A-beta protein. So we'll see, they're underway now. There are also drugs to try and prevent people with MCI, this mild cognitive impairment, progressing to Alzheimer's disease. And there's one with tau therapeutics, looking at the tau protein, and another one looking at a beta, an enzyme that makes the A-beta protein. They're underway. What about people who already have Alzheimer's can we stop it progressing? Is there a pill to beat Alzheimer's? Is there a drug to halt Alzheimer's? Can cancer drugs stop Alzheimer's? Well, there are lots of strategies. Most of them are aimed at the amyloid, the A-beta protein, either blocking the enzymes that make it or getting antibodies to block it. There are also drugs against the tau protein. Our current drugs are symptomatic drugs. They're chemicals to try and boost the chemicals are deficient in the, in the brain, but they don't stop the disease process. There are many, many other drugs under development. Um, and I won't go through those. We'd like to get nerve growth factor into the brain to stimulate nerve growth. It's hard to get it into the brain. So people have used viruses as a vector to get into the brain or use nanotechnology. Many other treatments including stem cells, deep brain stimulation, and some nutraceuticals, Exona and Suvenade. And people have made claims. This was on 60 Minutes. This is a doctor in uh, Los Angeles who injects a tanacept uh, into the base of the, uh, of the cervical spine in the neck and claimed miraculous improvements. Never been subject to a randomized control trial. The realism, so the hope is we'll find the drug. The realism, so far it's been a graveyard. We have not had a new drug despite billions of dollars in the last 16 years of research for Alzheimer's disease. And why? Well, maybe we've been treating people too late in the disease. It's the wrong time. Maybe we've had the wrong target. We've been doing it mainly at the amyloid. Maybe it's the wrong patient. Because looking at people who've been in these trials, now with the new technology to image the amyloid, we're finding 30% of people in trials diagnosed with Alzheimer's didn't have the amyloid. Or maybe it's the wrong model. Using one drug isn't going to work. In tuberculosis, in helicobacter with the stomach ulcers, in leukemias, we use multiple drugs simultaneously in attacking a disease. And maybe that's the approach we'll need. So silver bullets, not yet. Billions invested with no return. Pharma is still interested. Most trials are for Alzheimer's. The World Dementia Council has set a target of 2025 for a cure. Well, there's been some calculations. That's looking less likely. And in a very influential article in The Lancet, November last year, they came out and reviewing all these drugs and said the mainstay of treatment is the family, the family. So let me finish up with achieving quality of life. For persons living with dementia and their carer, reducing stigma, building dementia-friendly communities, 
having professionals who are skilled, empathic, and knowledgeable across all settings, having a timely diagnosis, and having good practices, and that the Australian Clinical Practice Guidelines, which came out last year, and are now available for in a, in a consumer format as well as for clinicians, is an advance in that area. People need proactive guidance and care during the pathway of their dementia, the so-called key worker concept. We need better use of medication, better community care, better management of behavioural and psychological symptoms, empowering people with dementia and their families, and research on how to achieve all of these things. So let me finish up. There is hope. There's a lot of research on dementia, not just Alzheimer's, the other dementias too. And research can drive drug development, improvements in diagnosis, improvements in care. We've got a lot of great people in Australia doing this research. And what's happening now with the internet and with Zoom and with all these other electronic devices, people are coming together all over the world. Consortium, consortia are being formed and collaborations are really advancing this, giving us huge numbers to be able to answer some of these questions. The major issue for research is funding. We're proportionally low against any denominator, other major diseases like diabetes or uh, stroke or cancer, against the disease burden, number of people affected, the cost of healthcare, dementia needs more funding. And one of my hobby horses is an Australian Dementia Registry. Because if we achieve that, and I know the Institute, National Institute for Dementia Research is considering this, that would improve recruitment for dementia uh, trials. Dementia research brings hope, but we need to have realistic expectations of preventing cognitive decline, delaying onset of dementia, and working for drugs to delay or stop the degenerative processes such as Alzheimer's disease. Thank you very much. Thank you.